Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 19 of No Longer Enslaved, where we have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. This is part three of my seven part series called Transformation Through Spiritual Mapping. If you are joining me just for the first time, I want to welcome you. I'm glad that you found me. I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, subscribe to my channel and make sure you hit that notification bell. Um, I've had several people alert me that they're no longer getting notified, even though um, they did hit that notification bell. So just check it regularly, I guess. Uh, YouTube likes to mess with things that way, unfortunately. I'm also on Rumble uh, under No Longer Enslaved, so you can find me there as well. And if you are joining me just for the first time, you may not be familiar with what spiritual mapping is. So let me just give a brief definition of it, and then we can dive into the meat of what we're going to talk about today. So spiritual mapping, it utilizes historical research, current demographics, also prophetic revelation and strategic intercession to release the redemptive purposes of God in a city, a state, a region, a nation, whatever it is that focus of the spiritual mapping project is. Essentially what spiritual mapping does is it provides information about the spiritual atmosphere of a given area. And what that does is then it informs our intercession so we can strike at the root of the issues. Uh, C. Peter Wagner, those of you that are familiar with him, um, he once said that, uh, you know, what an x-ray is to a surgeon, spiritual mapping is to an intercessor. So that just gives you a little bit of a brief understanding of spiritual mapping. And in today's episode, what I'm going to be talking about is ley lines, portals, spiritual gates, and grids. I also want to take some time to share with you uh, some of the mistakes we've made over the years and the lessons that we've learned as a result. So um, now just to dig in, I think let's start with uh, ley lines. So ley lines uh, is a term that was coined by Alfred Watkins back in 1912. And he was an amateur archeologist, historian, and photographer. But how he described ley lines is he said that they are um, an alignment of ancient burial mounds, of monuments, or castles. So there's these sacred points uh, that are aligned. That was his uh, working definition of uh, a ley line. Then years later, uh, one of the foremost experts of spiritual mapping, his name is George Otis Jr. He defines ley lines this way. He says, they're geographic continuums of spiritualized power that are established or at least recognized by the early inhabitants of an area. So what we find over the course of time is that these ley lines are reinforced by ongoing worship at high places, by um, you know ritualistic bloodshed. And then what happens is these power points are then formed along this ley line, and that establishes a spiritual pathway um, between these geographically aligned power points. Another thing to think about as far as ley lines is it's they span time, which means they don't expire with the passing of a generation. And this is why it's really imperative, uh, you know, if we're going to be cleansing the land, redeeming the land, that we have to do research. We have to dig into the history of the area to identify what are the roots of defilement that are operating on the land. As I've mentioned before, there are four types of iniquity that really are the primary root causes for a stronghold to develop in a territory. And those are sexual perversion or fornication, idolatry, broken covenants, and bloodshed. And so what, what happens is these, these root issues, these iniquities, what they do is they, um, they send up shoots that attract further defilement in this area. And what that does is that strengthens the demonic entanglement over a territory. And a good way to think about it, you know, here in the Mountain West region, we have, uh, some people call it morning glory. It's not really morning glory. It's called bindweed. And I hate this thing. It, it's so terrible to get out of your yards because bindweed has a root system that goes very deep into the soil. But what it does is it sends these shoots up to the surface and you know they wrap themselves around plants trying to choke out the plants and i'm constantly trying to go after this weed well 
picking at the the you know the weed from the surface does nothing to eradicate the problem it's only when we strike at the root do we kill the weed and quite frankly i've been unsuccessful at that however um you know we just think about that as far as an example of what um a ley line can do now portals and spiritual gates are passageways that connect uh, the spiritual realm with the earth realm. And we can think about um, a biblical example uh, is found in Genesis 28. And this is when Jacob saw a ladder with angels descending and ascending. And I'll read a few verses from this chapter. This is verse 12 and then 16 and 17. It says, he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So here, if you know, we dig in and we look at the Hebrew word for gate, it's sha'ar. And it means an entrance to a city, a palace, or a temple. Well, you know, in understanding kind of biblical history and, um, you know, how how things happened back then, what you would often find is you would find either a king, a judge or elders would sit at the city gates and conduct prominent business. So a spiritual gate uh, is a place of prominence. Now, most people wouldn't differentiate between portals and spiritual gates, but I think I think there's a subtle difference. And that is connected to a place of prominence. So a spiritual gate is an entrance way to a place of prominence, you know, a city, a state, a region, a nation. Whereas portals are a passageway that don't necessarily have to be a place of prominence. Uh, and portals exist because someone has either set up an altar of honor to the Lord through offering up their worship or they've established an altar of offense through false worship. And in my experience, what I found is that, you know, portals are established when there's ongoing worship from a specific location. Um, I wanna give you actually an example. Um, and before I do, the other thing I wanna note is that portals can either be, you know, a place where there are heavenly visitations or a place where there's visitations from you know, spiritual forces of darkness. So they can either be positive or negative. And so this kind of ties into the example I wanted to give you. So uh, back in 2005, I traveled uh, with some youth because I was the youth minister back then. And we went to Torino, Italy. I took three youth with me and I was invited by some of the churches in Torino, Italy to help them prepare for hosting the Winter Olympics. And, you know, as you may remember, Salt Lake City was host of the Winter Olympics in 2002. And so as a spiritual mapping team, we had written up a, a mapping brief on the Olympics really to awaken people's understanding to the spiritual dynamics that come with the Olympics. And we were involved in a lot of different prayer initiatives around the city at that time, really preparing our city, Salt Lake City, to be able to host the Olympics and not take on the, the, the spiritual baggage that comes with the Olympics. So anyways, um, I had had opportunity to meet some of the church leaders in Torino and they invited us to come and help them. So in 2005 we did and like I said I traveled with three youth and we had opportunity to stay with some very good friends of ours that lived in Pichetto Turinese which was about 20 minutes outside of Torino. So when we get there, you know, we're unpacking our bags and our friend uh, wants to show us, you know, their place and, and their, their yard. And it's just an absolutely gorgeous home that they're living in and uh, they have a lot of land that they're on as well. So we were walking in, you know, the yard and she began to share with us some of the very unusual experiences they've had while living there. They have repeatedly found fetishes. Now, a fetish is an object with a curse attached to it. And so when they were finding these fetishes, um, you know, right around that time, their children would have fairly significant injuries while playing in their yard. 
Then the other thing that was really interesting is, uh, you know, they, because they had such a big home and they were from the United States, but they're living in Italy, they had a lot of guests come and stay with them, which was wonderful. Um, and they had several different guest rooms. Well, one of the guest rooms um, in, the, in the lower floor, they think that there may be a portal in this room because there were several guests that, you know, would come and stay there and they would report having nightmares. Well, guest after guest would report nightmares of the similar theme. And so it really clued my friends in that there might be something here spiritually. And so they had discerned a portal and then other people that had come and stayed with them confirmed that yes, there was a portal. So she wanted just to get further confirmation. So she took us into the room and the room is a really big, room it's like three times the size of a normal bedroom and she didn't tell us where in the room the portal was but we walked around and we noticed it right away because standing in that portal there was a real tangible presence this dark presence and so we um, in the midst of that portal began taking dominion authority over that portal and you know jesus he reclaimed our dominion authority through his life, death, and resurrection. And so we can stand in the promises of Matthew 16, 19, which is exactly what we did in the midst of that portal. And that scripture says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. So what we did is we took our keys to the kingdom of heaven and we shut the door to the spiritual forces of darkness using that portal and we opened it to the flow of the Holy Spirit. And then we just remained in that portal and just began worshiping. And you could feel the shift happen. I mean, it was tangible because the presence of the Lord filled that portal as we were worshiping and we could sense angelic visitation as well. So that's an example, um, and I've had several examples of portals, but that's just one of them. Now, a spiritual gate, um, I want to share a story about an encounter that we've had with a spiritual gate. Now, remember, spiritual gates are generally located in a place of prominence. And so years ago, as a spiritual mapping team, we had been praying and asking the Lord to show us the spiritual gates over our city and the spiritual gates to our, our state, the state of Utah. And one of the, the gates that he showed us was a place called Memory Grove. Now, in the natural realm, Memory Grove is a groomed park that is adjacent to our state capital. And it's a park that has many different uh, monuments in them, and it is honoring fallen veterans. But in the spiritual realm, it's a gate for the Queen of Heaven. And... You know, the Lord is just so amazing how he reveals these things to us. So uh, back, let's see, it was August 11th, 1999. I happened to be home. I normally, I was working full time as a psychologist and I was working downtown at a substance abuse treatment clinic. So I would have been downtown on this day, but my daughter was sick. And so I was at home caring for her. And while she was napping, I thought, I'm just going to spend some time in silence before the Lord, just to be able to um, be still in His presence, and it was a practice that I had um, developed over the t over time. And I just absolutely love being still before the Lord. Well, on this particular day, um, there was a fierce storm going on outside, and what the Lord said was that the sound of the storm over you know our valley was actually the sound of the spiritual battle happening over. Salt Lake City that day. And so within an hour after I had that experience, I realized that a tornado had ripped through downtown Salt Lake City. And we never get tornadoes through downtown. In fact, that was the first ever tornado. Now, that was startling. That kind of, you know, alerted me, okay, Lord, what what is happening over our city that a tornado would come through. I mean, that's an intense spiritual battle happening. So a few weeks later, again, I was just um, in a time of prayer before the Lord. And this time, instead of just being still, I was coming to him with a question and asking him 
to help us understand how the Queen of Heaven is operating in our city. And, and where is this Queen of Heaven operating from? And what the Lord told me is he said, follow the path of the tornado, especially Memory Grove. Now, at that time, I did not know what Memory Grove was. I had never been there. I probably had heard about it once or twice, but it wasn't something that was, um, you know, forefront of my mind. And I certainly had not paid attention to the path of the tornado. So, of course, the researcher in me got extremely interested and I began, you know, pouring through scripture to try and learn as much as I could about the Queen of Heaven, but then also scouring historical documents and looking at um, newspapers to find this path of the tornado. And sure enough, it went through Memory Grove. And so I knew the Lord was alerting us to Memory Grove. So as I was digging through scripture, one of the things that's very interesting is the Hebrew word for grove is Asherah. Well, Asherah is a Canaanite goddess of fertility, and it's one of the deities that's assumed by the Queen of Heaven. And so, you know, the Bible uses um, the word Asherah not just to denote this fertility goddess, but also as a noun to denote a cult object or a high place. So an Asherah pole um, is oftentimes like this carved wooden image of the goddess Asherah, but it also is represented by a sacred tree. You see, what would happen is, you know, with the worship to the Queen of Heaven, this oftentimes would happen within groves. Groves were considered these open sanctuaries for pagan worship. And oftentimes with worship towards the Queen of Heaven, there was sexual immoral activity that would happen. And I want to read to you from 1 Kings 14, verses 22 through 24. Judah did I, excuse me, Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. By the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealous anger more than those who were before them had done. They also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones, and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. The people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. So this passage shows us that there are aspects of worship to the Queen of Heaven that involve male shrine prostitutes. Also, we see that, you know, they're setting up Asherah poles and um, under spreading trees. So in understanding that biblical foundation for the Queen of Heaven, I then turned to scouring through historical documents about Memory Grove. I wanted to learn as much as I could. You know, why was it formed? When was it built? You know, all of that sort of stuff. Well, in doing so, I actually came across a very important article in the Salt Lake Tribune, and this was dated September 30th, 1991. And in this article, they began speaking about how uh, Memory Grove used to be this place where, you know, you could bring family, your family, and enjoy a wonderful afternoon. It was a beautiful park. It's in a beautiful part of the city. But something shifted in 1986, and it became a place where transients, thugs, and gay men would hang out. And there was this indiscreet solicitous, solicitization of sex. That's a hard word to say. So Memory Grove essentially became this place of crime and where um, gay men would go to find partners. Now, it also was listed in Dameron's Guide. Now, Dameron's Guide is like, the fedors um, for homosexual travel. You know, if you want to travel the United States as a homosexual and you want to know what are the areas that are particularly um, hospitable, you you would look up Dameron's Guide. And this was back like in 19, the 1990s. And so um, when you look in Dameron's Guide, Memory Grove was listed as one of the hottest places in Utah to find partners. So this presented a problem for the city. So what they decided to do is actually close the street that ran through Memory Grove because they thought, you know, if less people are there, then maybe there will be less um, deviant activity. Well, that kind of backfired on the city. And what happened is because there was less traffic, 
there actually was more deviant behavior. And so um, the gay men would become even less discreet in soliciting sex among the trees. Well, this is a modern day example of a male shrine prostitute worship to the queen of heaven. So once we understood this, um, we then began to see the significance of what the Lord did with this tornado because he ripped up 175 trees in Memory Grove. So these are 175 Asherah poles. When he did that, he exposed what was happening there because these trees could no longer hide the deeds of darkness that were happening among the trees. He exposed it all. And when he did that, we realized, okay, we need to go in and begin to cleanse the land and redeem the land. And so we took uh, teams of intercessors for years, actually two and a half years. We did reconnaissance in the beginning and, um, you know, with, I wrote up a spiritual mapping prayer brief and then we did informed intercession. Well, I just want to share a couple of highlights from one of our reconnaissance trips. It actually was our very first one. So we had, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 people that came. It was, it was phenomenal to have so many people. And one of the people that came, um, she is a hairdresser and she happened to cut hair of someone who knew the person that lived in the house right next to Memory Grove. And that person was the head warlock over the area. And so she tells us this literally while we're standing in front of this house. And we're like, okay, Lord, what are you showing us? Well, there's a sidewalk, you know, right in front of this house that leads into Memory Grove. And it's, it's a flagstone sidewalk. Well, we began just to kind of look around and ask the Lord to like peel back any veil that we have over our eyes so that we can see what he wants us to see, what's happening in this land. Well, we noticed that laid out in the flagstone was an image of the Queen of Heaven. Now, the Queen of Heaven has assumed numerous deities over time and in different cultures. So there's all sorts of images for the Queen of Heaven. But generally, there's a focus on the female reproductive organs because it's a fertility goddess and also the breasts. Well, what we found was specifically cut and laid flagstone to form the Queen of Heaven. So there was two legs that came up to where the reproductive organs are, and then the body with a breast protruding out the side, two arms raised up like this, and then the head had this conical hat on top of it. So we thought, this is not by chance that these flagstones just happened to be laid in this way. This was purposeful. So then a few paces forward towards Memory Grove, again, specifically cut in the flagstone was a pentagram. Then we walked into Memory Grove and we decided to kind of look around because you could see this house that was owned by the head warlock once you were inside of Memory Grove as well. And we walked towards where we could see the back of the house. Well, on the second story balcony was hanging a noose. And we had one of our team members was from Montana and he knows knots like no one else. <laughs> and he said, there's only one reason why you use a knot for a noose and that is to hang someone so the lord just began showing us things we moved a little bit further into the park and memory grove sits in a canyon so there's a hillside that goes up on the side well both sides um, but the capital sits on top of that hillside and so from where we were we were looking at the walkway that goes up to the capital now again the Lord ripped up 175 trees. So that hillside where the walkway is generally is filled with trees. But because there were no more, we were actually able to see. And in fact, this was my husband. He noticed this is that the walkway leading up to the Capitol is the same shape as this Queen of Heaven cut in the flagstone. So there was two pathways that lead up. And then in the middle where the, the female reproductive organs would be was a circular monument. And then there, the pathways went back up on either side and that represented the, the hands raised and the head of the Queen of Heaven 
was the Capitol Rotunda. When we discovered that, we realized, okay, Lord, you are you are revealing um, how the Queen of Heaven is operating in our city and in our state. Well, later, um, probably a few months later, uh, another one of our intercessors was just hiking up by Memory Grove. And beyond the groomed park, there's another memorial that we hadn't noticed the first time we were there, and it's called the James Austin Memorial. And she, as she was there, she did not get a good sense, like her discernment was alerting her. So she called us and, and we sent a small team back. And when we went to the James Austin Memorial for the first time, we recognized that this actually was an altar of offense. So uh, the James Austin Memorial has um, a, a stairway that leads up to it with two different landings. Well, actually three. So at the base of the stairways, again, specifically cut in the flagstone are pentagrams. Then the second landing has a, a um, flagstone cut in the shape of a circle, which, you know, casting a sacred circle is used in all sorts of pagan rituals. And then you go to the top where the actual memorial is for James Austin. And it is, it stands probably about three and a half feet tall and about maybe four feet long. And it's made of stone. And the, the top brim of it is a, a big slab of concrete. Well, when we got there, there was melted red candle wax on top of the the slab and we knew that this was a place where rituals were taking place on either side of this altar on the flagstone landing again pentagrams within a circle this time and so it was very clear to us uh, what was happening now i share those things because what the lord had us do is through the reconnaissance and through discernment he began putting pieces together for us that informed our intercession and we took teams of people there to worship, to intercede, to cleanse the land for two and a half years, really. And then we felt like that season of warfare had ended. Um, but years later, now this is about four or five years ago, the Lord showed us that the governor, Governor Levitt, so he was governor of Utah at the time of the tornado. He had some of those trees that were torn up. So these are the Asherah poles. He had them um, set aside and they took the wood from those trees and they carved and made the governor's desk. So the governor's desk is made with defiled Asherah poles. So we clearly have some more work to do um, as far as anointing and cleansing that. Um, so I share all that because that's an example of a spiritual gate. Okay, so now I want to share about spiritual grids. So as Spiritual grids really are created from multiple ley lines that are connected together over a territory or a region. So you have these defiled ley lines that form like this, this corridor that connects these sacred sites. And what happens is it establishes this demonic stronghold over territory. And people that live amidst a, you know, a, a spiritual grid, they may be completely unaware that it, it, it it even exists, but they are definitely impacted by it. And so um, back to Torino. Uh, Torino is actually the intersection of two witchcraft triangles across the face of the earth. It's the black magic triangle and the white magic triangle. So the cities that make up the black magic triangle are San Francisco, London, and Torino. And then the cities that make up the white magic triangle are Prague, Lyon, and Torino. So with Torino being the apex of these two triangles, it really has developed a reputation as being the witchcraft capital of the world. In fact, they do magic tours at midnight um, to show you all the, the spots where witchcraft happens throughout the city. So it's very intense. Now, one day um, on this trip that we took, um, I've been to Torino a few times, but this was the first trip um, that I took with the youth, you know, in helping prepare the church leaders uh, to host the Winter Olympics. Because, um, you know, I had teenagers with me, they're, they're great kids, but this was the first time that they were out of the country and they were feeling homesick. 
And so one of the days um, I realized, okay, we need to just go for a walk, um, kind of debrief. I need to check in with them, see how they're doing, just care for them. So we go for this walk um, and it's, you know, we're, we're staying in um, Pachetta Tornice with our friends and we just go for a walk um, down the hill from where their home is. And it's in this valley, um, you know, of farmland. And the walk starts out wonderful. We're debriefing and then we get into this valley and all sorts of like our discernment is just getting triggered. And we realize that we are in the midst of something very intense. And it actually was the first time I had ever experienced being in the midst of a spiritual grid. What, what happened was as we were walking in this valley, um, I started seeing, I'm a seer, so I can see into the spiritual realm. I started seeing objects like moving really fast away from me. It was like particles or objects. And the best thing that I can liken it to is the scene in Star Wars, you know, when the Millennium Falcon goes into hyperdrive and the stars just like come forward. Well, that's what I was seeing only in reverse. Things were moving away from me. And so I stopped and I shared that and the others couldn't see it, but one of the gals could feel it. She was feeling things going through her body. Well, something all of us felt, all four of us, is this extremely foul odor. It smelled like sulfur. And as we were walking and discerning, we just began to ask the Lord, what is this and why are we here? And he began to reveal to us that he brought us there to sever that ley line that was part of the spiritual grid. And so we did using our prayers. And when we severed that ley line, the Holy Spirit showed us, okay, now you have to invite my presence in to fill that vacuum that you just severed. And we did, and immediately the odor switched and it changed to this refreshing pine scent and the sulfur smell was gone and it was remarkable. All four of us noticed it and we were just rejoicing because this was a tangible example to us that we had accomplished what the Lord wanted us to accomplish in the spiritual realm. So we got back to our friend's house and we told her, you know, what had happened. And she actually wasn't surprised because a lot of the locals understand that there is an energy field down in that valley. In fact, people from all over will travel just to experience that energy field. So that was an example of um, what a spiritual grid is like. Now, I told you that I wanted to share a couple of mistakes that we've made and the lessons that we've learned from them. So this is going back again to 2002, you know, when Salt Lake City was hosting the Winter Olympics. Um, you know, there's lots of tourism that was gonna be coming in and out of the city. And so as a result of that tourism, what, excuse me, what the Freemasons um, decided to do is they wanted to open the Masonic Temple for tours. So as a spiritual mapping team, we thought this is an incredible opportunity to do some reconnaissance. So we met as a team and we just, um, you know, asked everyone to kind of pray. So we spent some time in prayer and then we asked folks to share what their sense was. Was God giving us the green light or should we not go? Well, everyone that shared felt like God was giving us the green light. And so we decided as a team that this is what we're going to do. So we picked a date. We scheduled the tour and we went in. Now, I have to say, for me personally, going inside the Masonic Temple uh, in downtown Salt Lake City was as spiritually intense as being in Torino. Um, those are probably the two most spiritually intense times that I've ever experienced. <clears throat> so when we went inside, you know, I, I felt um, just this heaviness. I mean, the, the darkness, spiritual darkness was palpable. So you feel this heaviness and I felt dizzy. I felt nauseous. There were points on the tour where like confusion landed on me and I'm generally not a confused person. Then there was a, a particular room in the temple that I literally felt something like pressing down on my head in the spiritual realm. So it was a very intense experience to say the least. And we were taking tons of notes. Um, we were discreetly taking pictures 
and um, we were gathering information about what happens inside this Masonic temple. Now, they don't tell you everything, but you know, through our discernment, through what we were seeing. And we only spent maybe an hour to two hours inside the temple, um, but like I said, it was really intense. So shortly after that, our spiritual mapping team came under attack we had, you know, members who were having significant marital issues where, you know, before that marriages were fine. We had mem um, team members who were dealing with significant health issues that had arisen. And then also like financial hardships had hit us. And so we regrouped and we were debriefing as a team and recognized, okay, we, we've come under some attack here. And as we were meeting as a team, there were two of our team members who are a bit more introverted and they hadn't shared during that initial meeting where we decided to go to the Masonic Temple. And what they told us as we were debriefing is that they actually had to check in their spirit that we shouldn't go, but they didn't feel comfortable in sharing that because everyone else felt like we should go. So they really kind of questioned or doubted their own um, discernment or what they were hearing from the Lord. So this was a really important lesson we learned as a team, and that is everyone's perspective and input is important. You know, some some team members have lots to share. M maybe it's like a cup full that they have. And other team members maybe only have a teaspoonful. But if we don't bring to the team what the Lord has given us, then we don't get the full picture. And so we really learned an important lesson that day that everyone needs to feel comfortable in sharing, even if it goes counter to what other people are experiencing or sharing. Now, the other thing that we learned is our deliverance minister came to us as a team and she said, you guys did not pray through the Freemasonry prayers, breaking off those generational curses of Freemasonry. And we realized, oh my gosh, we hadn't. Now, each of us had gone through deliverance. We had gone through personal deliverance, but it was at a time before our deliverance minister had developed these prayers to break off the curses of Freemasonry specifically. So we hadn't done that. And many of our team members, you know, we come from an Anglo-European ancestry where Freemasonry was very rampant. And, you know, so we might have people in our generational line that engaged in Freemasonry. Well, this was a really important lesson because we had overlooked that important step of making sure that we were cleansed and that any doors, you know, that were open to the demonic were closed. Um, and because we, we overlooked that step, we came under attack. We were exposed, in other words. And so I wanted to share those mistakes with you and the lessons that we learned because I don't want you to make the same mistakes. I want you to learn from, you know, what we did, what we should have done differently. And that is, it's so important when, when you guys begin to do spiritual mapping, which I'm encouraging you to do, I just want to make sure that each one of you takes it very seriously and, and recognizes that this is intense spiritual warfare. We're all as believers, as you know, spirit-filled um, followers of Jesus. We are equipped to do this, but we we need to take it seriously, and we need to prepare. We need to cleanse ourselves, and we want to cleanse ourselves of sin and um, you know repent for any iniquity, not only in our own lives but in our family line, because we, like I said, we don't want to step into spiritual mapping having those doorways open to demonic influence because we will be afflicted if we've not taken care of those generational curses and closed those doors and gotten freedom in that way. You know, a, a, an analogy to think about is it would be a little bit like, um, you know, if we're doing a special ops uh, mission where we're doing surveilling enemy territory and we go in and we have these beeping sensors with flashing lights you know, that it's not going to take the enemy long to figure out where we are and we would draw enemy fire. Well, in a similar way, if we've not cleansed ourselves and our family line, we can have like a beeping sensor when we go to do spiritual warfare. So I just wanted to um, encourage us to not be afraid to do spiritual mapping, 
but to take it seriously and to recognize that we need to take those steps to cleanse ourselves so that when we go into battle, we're not exposed in that way. And what I'll do is in the description box below, I'll put a couple of links to deliverance ministries um, that you know, you can access online because I know many of you do not attend churches that have deliverance ministries. So I'll put some links there. I also will put a link for the Freemasonry prayers that you can pray through on your own or you can, you know, pray with a friend or pray with a spouse or another family member through those things. And that will help equip you to be able to, to step out and do spiritual mapping. So I just am super grateful that you're joining me. I want to thank you. And until next time, I want to encourage each of us that we would stand firm, that we would let nothing move ourselves, that we would always give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord because we know our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Thanks for joining me.